Welcome to video six on justice. So we're going to be covering two major sections. First we're just going to do an overview of the concept of justice and then we're going to look at one argument from a great philosopher. We're going to look at John Rawls on justice. When we cover the basics of the concept of justice we'll look at a taxonomy of justice that is a list of kinds of justice, aspects of justice. We will look at justice in terms of principles and we will look in medical ethics specifically at the distinction between micro allocation and macro allocation. Most people when they think of justice immediately think of criminal justice. So their primary association with the word justice are law courts and lawyers um, and situations where someone has done something wrong and a punishment needs to be given or figured out, right? Or maybe you just need to figure out whether something has been done wrong. Now this is a part of justice. It is not the whole of justice though. So we need to, before we get anywhere in talking about justice in healthcare, talk about the justice in the broadest possible sense. Really what justice is, is um, a kind of consistency in ethics. It is the, a general sense that when two situations are similar, they should be treated similarly. So this is what Aristotle calls the formal notion of justice, treating similar cases similarly. The other phrase he uses to describe this is giving each their due. So part of being consistent is doing this, the right thing in each individual case. More broadly, Justice is a part of a general virtue which we can call fair-mindedness. Fair-mindedness is the virtue that lets people participate in a mutually beneficial cooperative enterprise. So fair-mindedness is what lets us work together as a species. We're you know, a cooperative social animal and we would not be able to succeed in cooperating unless we as individuals were fair-minded. So justice is a part of fair-mindedness. It involves consistency and giving each their due. In a simple sense, um, on a test, if you're asked to define justice, uh, a, the line treating similar cases similarly would be adequate. Although, of course, you'll, it'll, act, it'll take some time to unpack exactly what that means. So the next step is to look at justice in general and all of the things that go into under, go under this concept, treating similar cases similarly. The easiest way to think about justice as a whole is to go back to Aristotle's categories of justice. Aristotle distinguished justice in the formal and particular sense. The formal idea of justice is this attitude that we were just talking about previously. It, treating similar cases similarly. Um, he calls this the formal idea of justice because it doesn't provide any content to the notion of justice. It's just a format in which that you can plug in ideas of justice. Uh, he also called this complete virtue with regard to others. Justice was the, the virtue you had in treating others, uh, treating others right, properly, fairly. This is again formal justice because there's no real content to it. He doesn't say how you should treat others. It just says that you should treat them properly. And this is the same as it was for the definition treating similar cases similarly. It doesn't tell you what counts as similar. It just says do the same thing each time. But what same thing are you doing? We don't know yet. An example here will help. We say that right now a fair hiring practice is one that looks at your ability to do the job and not your, and not your skin color or gender. We say that some things are relevant and some things aren't. Um, so two candidates of different skin color with the same qu job qualifications would be treated the same. That's formal justice. But to do that, we have to make these additional assumptions about the content of justice, that job qualifications matter and skin color doesn't. So the business of putting co 
content in the notion of formal justice falls over on the side of particular justice. And this gets further divided into distributive and rectifying or retributive justice. Rectifying or retributive justice is about how you treat people when things have gone wrong. So this is where we get criminal justice, which is what we were talking about at the beginning, and we described it as most people's most common association with the word justice. Criminal justice is a form of rectifying or retributive justice. That actually refers to a specific subcategory of it, uh, the laws that are imposed on you on everyone in the country, whether they like it or not. The other half of retributive justice is contract law. This is all about things that you enter into voluntarily. Healthcare doesn't have doesn't have to deal much with rectifying or retributive justice. Mostly what we deal with in healthcare is distributive justice. Distributive justice is justice that has to do with the normal functioning of a society. In the normal functioning of a society, you have certain burdens and certain benefits. There's work and there, there's money. Right? You have to decide who gets the work and who gets the money. Any time that you are deciding who gets what, that's distributive justice. Interestingly, you can do the same sorts of things in both distributive and rectifying justice. A tax on rich people to pay for health care for poor people is a bit of distributive justice because it's part of the normal functioning of society. On the other hand, a fine levied against a rich person for illegal insider trading, say, is rectifying justice because that person had to do something wrong before the fine was imposed. Either way, though, society is charging them. Okay, this is a list of justice terms um, taken from the previous slide. I've just spelled them out all out here for your reference. You can come back to the slide whenever you need to to look at these. Principles of distributive justice. Justice is another subject like autonomy where many philosophers tend to resort to principles to describe what should and shouldn't be done. Distributive justice in particular uh, is known for using a lot of principles based reasoning. So here's a list of some principles that can be used to uh, distribute benefits and burdens. Four of these are taken from the back of Munson. The fifth I am adding because I think it is frequently confused for the, uh, latter, of the, two, the, the latter of the two on Munson's list and because it is actually much more important in the philosophical literature than many of the other things that Munson discusses. So let's start at the beginning. Equality. The principle of equality is really simple. What can be split is split evenly. And other things are distributed randomly or by people taking turns. Um, all of the principles of equal distribution should be familiar to anyone who's ever had to deal with children. Um, when you teach children to share, um, when you tell them to divide the candy evenly, to take turns on the swings, you are reinforcing a principle of equal distribution. Um, there are also cases in medicine where people use equal distribution. Uh, and the most famous one mentioned in, in your Munson textbook is the beta seron lottery, where there was a limited supply of a drug available, and the people who got the drug were chosen randomly. A more familiar principle of distribution in a medical context is need. Um, resources go to those who need them most. Uh, emergency room triage works this way. This principle, of course, also has some famous applications outside of medicine. When Karl Marx said, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, he was stressing a principle of um, need-based distribution and justice. Okay. The last three are often 
confused, so I want to I want to look at them all at once. Contribution, effort, and free exchange. Um, free exchange is the actual principle lying behind capitalism. Free exchange says that whatever distribution of labor and resources results from people trading freely is good. The free exchange principle is often confused with the contribution principle. The contribution principle, more, resource, more resources go to those who successfully contribute to the group. The free exchange principle is also confused with the effort principle. Under the effort principle, more resources go to those who tried to contribute more. Now this is different than the contribution principle because of course you can try very hard but not accomplish much. Now it is often said that the main reason why socialist command economies of the sort we saw in the Soviet Union and Maoist China failed was that they were working on a need-based principle of distribution and as a result no one had any incentive to contribute. The command economies uh, of the old Soviet Union and Maoist China did not reward either contribution or effort. However, just because the communist countries did not reward contribution and effort doesn't mean that the capitalist system is built all is built entirely around contribution and effort. In fact, it is not. The capitalist system is built around free exchange, and it is hoped that this will indirectly allow contribution and effort to be rewarded. There are, however, obvious cases where the principle of free exchange does not wind up rewarding either contribution or effort. High school teachers, grade school teachers, teachers in general, contribute far more to our society than basketball players. However, the principle of free exchange, the, the capitalist economy, has not wound up rewarding teachers as much as basketball players. Similarly, a coal miner may uh, will probably pr work harder, may produce more effort than an investment banker. Nevertheless, the investment banker is rewarded more on the free exchange principle. Nevertheless, the success, the relative success of the capitalist economies over the communist economies that use the, the Soviet command style economy indicates that, that the capitalist economies do a better job of rewarding contribution and effort. However, it is not the case that contribution and effort are the direct principles of distribution at work in capitalist economies. A final important distinction we need to make is between macro allocation and micro allocation. Uh, these are two different kinds of allocation decisions. And as you can guess from the names, one involves small-scale decisions and one involves large-scale decisions. Specifically, micro-allocation involves decisions that directly affect individuals and take the current stru social structure and resource supply as fixed. Macro allocation refers to distribution questions where the answer might alter social structures or dramatically change the supply of the resources. Macro allocation decisions then would only affect individuals indirectly. Now, generally, the things like the allocation of organs and other scarce medical resources is considered micro allocation. And Questions about health care plans, paying for health care, uh, national health insurance are considered macro allocation questions. However, it's, it's not entirely the case. For instance, with organs, um, the decision of who goes to the front of the line for in an organ donor list or how organs get distributed nationally is a micro allocation decision. On the other hand, decisions 
involving how to procure organs are macro allocation because they affect the supply of organs. So the question of whether to allow the sale of kidneys would be a macro allocation question. For the last section, uh, we're going to look at one argument from one philosopher, John Rawls. So Rawls is developing a theory of one ethical concept, justice. He's not dealing with autonomy, moral status, naturalness. He's just dealing with justice. He calls his theory justice as fairness, because it is a way of fleshing out Aristotle's formal idea of justice that justice is treating similar situations similarly. So this is all particular justice. Now, what Rawls is doing is offering a version of social contract theory. And anyone, I think, who has had some civics lessons or American history classes should be familiar with social contract theory because it was the dominant theory amongst the people who founded our country. And the basic idea behind social contract theory is that society is founded on a contract. In, uh, our, in America, that contract is supposed to be the Constitution, or at least the Constitution is supposed to represent the contract that society is founded on. The idea with social contract, the the social contract theorists, these are people like Locke, Hobbes, and Rousseau, is that they imagine that we start out as isolated individuals and then ask, well, what causes us to come together to form a society? Why do we live in groups rather than as isolated individuals? And so their answers, they have various reasons, um, but their answer always involves people coming together and agreeing to form a society on the basis of a contract. So typically what they would do, what people like Locke, Hobbes, and Rousseau would do is imagine a state of nature before there was any society and uh, then figure out what kind of contract people would draw up to get out of the state of nature. Rawls wants us to wants to repeat the thought experiment that people did in the Enlightenment, where they ask, why do we come together to form a society? But he is not naive enough to think that there was ever a state of nature, or that really talking about the state of nature was a worthwhile thing to do. So instead, he substitutes for the state of nature the original position. The original position is a thought experiment. It, it's not something that anyone is actually in but it allows us to imagine the construction of a society. Basically, you have an imaginary negotiating table where all the principles of a society are agreed on. So imagine that everyone in this class, this virtual class, were gathered together in one room, and we had to decide what society would look like. This, is a, this, this original negotiating table is the substitute for the state of nature, imagined by Locke, Hobbes, and Rousseau. So, what, go, how, how, what goes on in this, at this negotiating table? Well, let's start by assuming that everyone is ideally rational. That may seem ridiculous, because most people, no one's ideally rational, and people are rarely rational at all. But remember, we're trying to figure out what the ideal society would be like, the most just society. So, after all, uh, we're going to want the most just society is going to come from people who are uh, smartest, who are best at setting up societies. The other thing is that everyone at the table is self-interested and independent. Self-interested, that means that they are only interested in securing the best deal for themselves in the society, and they are indifferent to what happens to others. They are also independent. Um, they don't need each other. Now here, what the real trick comes with the introduction of the veil of ignorance. The veil of ignorance is what makes Rawls's theory really special. It was his real innovation. Now the idea here is that unfairness in 
the design of a society comes when people set up the society to advantage themselves, right? In other words, people being self-interested will try to get the best deal for themselves. So, what what Rawls does is say, well, in fact, in behind the behind the veil of ignorance, you don't really know who you are. That is, um, you can try to s set up an advantage for yourself, but you don't um, you don't know whether you'll actually earn that advantage because you don't know who you are in society. So, in the original position, there are a bunch of things you don't know. The first is your place in the society you will construct. So now think about this. You could construct any kind of society you want, um, but you don't know what you're going to be in it. So you could say, oh yes, I want a society with masters and slaves, but the veil of ignorance could come up, and lo and behold, you're a slave and not a master. Right? Also, behind the veil of ignorance, you don't know your natural assets or abilities, your intelligence, your strength, etc. So you might say, in designing the veil of uh, in designing society behind the veil of ignorance, that uh, your society is just going to kill off all of all of the mentally retarded because they're a drain on society. And then the veil of ignorance is lifted, and it turns out that you are one of the mentally retarded that you just said would be killed off. Um, notice that what goes on in the original position involves you having a, a kind of intelligence that you don't really have. That's okay. This is just a thought experiment. We're making this up. Um, you also don't know your individual tastes and preferences. So you could say in your I, when you're making up your society that uh, homosexuality will be punished by death and then the veil of ignorance is lifted, and lo and behold, you discover that you are homosexual. So, by making the people in the original position ignorant of all of these aspects of themselves, Rawls ensures that they won't put in place laws that are unfair to certain kinds of people. Um, so, this, in Rawls's terms, ensures that no one is able to design principles to favor his particular condition. You can't try to favor yourself because you don't know anything about yourself. And this, in the end, means that the principles are, of justice are the results of a fair bargain. This is the core idea of justice for Rawls. Justice is a fair bargain from society. So, Rawls makes a couple claims in the reading about what uh, people would agree to in this hypothetical situation. First of all, he thinks that no one would accept the principle of utility. The principle of utility is defined in your textbook. This is the principle that says that um, everyone should act for the greatest good for the greatest number. And Rawls says, well, that's not the way things are set up here. We're not trying to maximize goodness. Everyone's just trying to ensure that they get a fair deal. What Rawls says instead is that people will agree, agree on what he calls the two principles, the two principles of justice, the basic principles of justice. Um, the first, uh, and most important, is that basic rights should be upheld. And this means maximizing liberty for all to the extent that is possible. Um, so, you know, you have the most amount of liberty you can without infringing on someone else's liberty. Furthermore, inequalities of any sort will only be allowed in the society if they maximize well-being for the worst off. And this is what's called the difference principle. It's a very famous principle. Now, it might be hard to visualize right off the bat what Rawls is talking about when he says maximize well-being for the worst off. And it's helpful to put this in a Cold War context. Rawls is writing in the middle of the Cold War, and uh, the world seems divided between you know, the 
communist world, in the capitalist world. Um, and one of the things that see, it happens in the communist world is that everyone has an e ha is supposed to have, ideally, um, an equal share of the wealth. Right? So the communist societies advertise themselves as having the kind of distribution you see in the chart on the left, where everyone is almost equal in terms of wealth. Uh, the poorest 1% and the richest 1% aren't that different. Capitalism looks like the society on the right, where you, know, you have a vast difference in the amount of wealth between the richest and poorest. But, and this is, this is something that really was historically instrumental in the fall of the Soviet Union, Although everyone in the communist society is equal, they all seem to be equally poor. And the worst off in the capitalist society remain better off than everyone in the communist society. So what you see is that the um, if you were a rational person, and you didn't know. You're behind the veil of ignorance. You don't know if you're going to be born rich or poor. No matter what, you're still going to choose society, too. Because you, no matter what, you've got more wealth. Now, there's a, there's a writer here. That, you know, um, Rawls is saying this to justify capitalism in some ways. But what he winds up doing is justifying a very limited form of capitalism because the inequalities created by capitalism are only legitimate to the extent that they actually help the poor. Um, they do this typically by providing people for an incentive to work so that the pie that's being redistributed is larger. But once inequalities in wealth stop creating more wealth, there is no reason to allow them. So what Rawls winds up advocating is a kind of restricted capitalism. And we now think of it as the wel welfare state kind of capitalism popular in Western Europe and Scandinavia. And that concludes Rawls's argument and this presentation.